Hello and welcome to Wayfinding, our Bible study turned podcast. Today we are going into John chapter 7, but first we have a time of Q&A with questions from my co-host Dylan and Daniel. So, over to you guys. I feel leveled up. Like, I've never been referred to as a co-host. And so I'm just what like, else? So I was trying to think of, like, what do I refer to you guys as? I don't really know. That's really the only yeah. thing I know of. I mean, my, my co-disciplers, I, like, uh, co-disciples, I don't know. Co-Jesus lovers. Co- my co-Jesus lovers every week. Uh, every week I'm going to come name. up with a new name for all of us. That's going to become a lot of work. <laughs> So I realized that you can tell a lot about a person by who their idol is. I'm really interested to hear yours, Benny, because I know that you brought up that you want to be a student pastor or that you've, you, your dream job was a student pastor. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, that's never really occurred to anybody just like to have a dream job to be a student pastor at a young age. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I would say... For me, it's always I, – I don't have like a one person that I like mm-hmm. idolize. And obviously, complete idolatry is bad. So like, <laughs> <laughs> on that front, I'm doing good. Um, what I do is I I do look to several people to learn from in different – and I learn different things from different people. So when I was looking to ministry and even in my life today – I would say I still have specific people that I look to that I learn from aspects of what they do that I can apply into my context. And so in that way, that's where I I idolize them. I look to how they're doing things, why they're doing things, seek to get an understanding of those things, and then apply it into my circumstance. So for ministry, lots of times I will look to, in terms of leadership, I look to Craig Rochelle at Life Church. He's he's great. He does monthly leadership podcasts, but just his content is is excellent to learn from. He's very organizationally gifted and and like he he's very organizational minded, and so that kind of helps give structure to organizations. Yeah. So I learned from him on that front. When I prepare a message, teaching a sermon, I look to, I really like Judah Smith. I I like his sermon framing and just the way that he shares stories of his personal life experiences and then connects them to the scripture and to the life application. So I learn a lot from him. I like the passion that Michael Todd has. And so I don't always get to apply a lot of his teaching style all the way because his Mm -hmm. teaching style is very uh, different than our culture here is. So I, I can't take too much from him, but I do learn by watching his messages as well. He gets very excited about his message. He is very into the message that he's uh, sharing that day. Mm -hmm. And I love that aspect of it. And just also it's, it's not great for his teaching style is not great for our culture. However, his attentiveness to his culture is something to learn from of it is good to pay attention to your culture and see how your people would respond, see how your people would learn best. What kind of stories do they connect with? You know, for example, in Illinois, I couldn't share too many stories if, or let's say if I would share stories of me uh, growing up on the busy streets in Chicago in San Antonio (laughs) and getting on, you know, like there's certain things that they don't, relate to perfectly, but maybe there's like familiar structures, like family related structures that they do relate to or school situations that they relate to. Mm -hmm. So my life stories, I would curate the stories that are from 
my school life or I would curate stories that are from whatever because that's what would relate to my audience. Mm -hmm. And so Michael Todd does that really well. Most recently, I would say Tim Ross, he has done a great job with the the basement podcast is where I found them. And his teachings are also very great. Like his, his sermons are great because he also takes care into who the audience is. And he, he forms the message specifically for what does that audience need to hear right now. But his authenticity is what I learned from in his podcast. Something I have loved listening through in that is just how vulnerable he is, how authentic he is, how deep he gets in every single episode. He he loves scripture. He loves unpacking it. He loves like going to the heart of the matter. He's also just very blunt about things. And I appreciate that value as well. So I would say I learned those things from Tim Ross. And so I take a lot of these aspects and apply them to my life. And so you find that when we do Bible study, the the vulnerability and, and the value in like embracing some of the harder harder topics, those like that comes from me listening to the basement, me listening to Tim Ross, me sharing different stories and trying to connect them all to what we're learning. I look at the structure from Judah Smith, the energy and passion that I get when this mostly goes to like, if I'm delivering a message to a uh, student ministry or, or something like that, then you see some aspects of like, it, it's a mix of like Judah Smith and Michael Todd that, that, mm-hmm. that you get most recently from me. So yeah, I just kind of learn from, from those people. Otherwise it's, it's like random people online, like, I'll find my other interests, as you guys know, is like business development, mm-hmm. professional self-development, stuff like that. So for that, I look at Gary Vaynerchuk. I look at most recently Alex Hermosi. Who else? I mean, those those are like the main two like business guys. Omar El Takori. He is a he's a YouTuber that has his own channel and is connected to a bigger brand called Think Media. And they have all sorts of resources for like, here's the best cameras as you're getting started with YouTube. Here's the best, uh, you know, here's the new camera that's out. Here's the new software that's out. Here's how you edit. Here's how there's all sorts of tutorial videos, all sorts of gear coverage, all that kind of stuff. As I kept watching more and more videos, come to find the founder of Think Media is a Christian and comes from the same background. Uh, Sean Cannell started in ministry, started as a youth pastor or serving in youth ministry, worked at his church doing all this production stuff, and then grew a YouTube channel so that he can explain the tech things to people. So anything related to how do you work a camera? What what does the new camera do? What is what do these mics do? What are your, your what are your best options with these mics? All that kind of stuff. That's that's how he started. And Omar El Takori, same thing. He's really into business development. He's really into helping new creators. And so Omar works now with Sean on the main channel, Think Media. But then Omar has his channel in which he now has his own podcast, and he incorporates his faith as well because he is a part time. Uh, well, no, he does his business full time. He's doing his own thing, but he also gets to guest teach at his church there in Las Vegas wow. because he too is just like super into fo- being a follower of Christ and pursuing him and how he can glorify God through his business efforts. And uh, I, I value listening to his podcast as well. I would say those are some of the people that I, I look to uh, now as inspirations. That's really cool. Who do you guys have as inspirations? I don't know, man. I'd say for me, I don't really like. I've never really had an idol, but I've gotten. I I really like listening to like people's testimonies on like YouTube and mm-hmm. listening to their stories, and just hearing how God has worked in them. In fact, yesterday, I was watching this. YouTube channel called I'm Second, which is... Yeah, they're great. Yeah. And it was this video about this 
guy and this ex-cop, or he might still be a cop, but I'm pretty sure it's ex-cop. The There's this ex-cop that needed to get somebody who was selling drugs off the street. This guy was walking out of the grocery store and the cop figured, oh, like it matched the description close enough. He'll just book him in. And he knew good and well, like this guy was innocent. Hmm. And so the, the uh, cop books him in under a different name, the guy who's supposed to be booked in, which isn't the guy that was booked in. So okay, yeah, and so so he books him. On, he books him in under the wrong name, but for that crime, yes, okay. And so the guy gets caught. The police officer gets caught, and the guy. Then then the guy that got sentenced to jail is like, "Oh, I'm finally free." Mm-hmm. The police officer goes in and just changes the. I don't remember what you call the it. The report or whatever? Yeah, the report. Just change it into his actual name. And so then that guy is never freed? Yeah. And <gasps> so that guy is now in prison. He's sentenced for 10 years. Oh my gosh. And the police officer just like ends up getting, after doing not necessarily that same thing, but like planting evidence and other corrupt wow. police officer stuff, ends up getting this like overwhelming feeling of guilt. And his wife is like, oh, like, why don't you go to church? And so he goes to church and he finds out like, oh, like, I need to go tell the FBI what I did Mm. and I need to go and like, I believe in Jesus. Like I've messed up. And don't make things right. Yeah. And then at the same time, the guy who he sentenced was also struggling with anger because the guy just sentenced him to 10 years, Ten years in, in prison, prison for, for nothing. For, yeah. For walking out of a grocery store. Wow. And the guy that they were looking for ended up being his cousin. Hmm. And so everything was pretty close. And I guess that was just good enough for it. But the guy ends up getting out of prison after the FBI does a full investigation of like, oh, like he, the police officer was right. Like he did do all these things wrong. And so the police officer gets and then it's like two years, just under two years, maybe, uh, in federal prison. And the guy who was falsely accused walks free and he's able to meet his son for the first time. And then they go to the park. The police officer is out of prison at this point and he's also at the park. And... That's really just interesting. The the way that they describe their first interaction, mm-hmm. it was hard to comprehend because you have this guy, this police officer that just ru- basically ruined this guy's life. Mm-hmm. I mean, took away three years, didn't meet his son till he was two. Yeah, and so you have to go back explain to your son, hey, like. I am not in your life because I got falsely accused of a crime. Mm-hmm. And explain that to like a, a three year old. Yeah, two or three year olds is not easy. <laughs> yeah. And so they end up meeting at a park. And at this point, they're both believers, but they don't know that they're believers. Hmm. And so they go about their ways after seeing each other. They talk to each other. And then they go to a job fair. And the. And the person that was falsely accused is looking for a job and their police officer is a mentor. And the lady that's connecting them is, has no idea about their past. And so the police officer goes in to meet this guy and he's like, oh, this is the guy that I put in jail for three years Mm -hmm. on purpose, knowing he did not do anything. Hmm. And you would think, oh, like, he would definitely, the guy that got falsely accused would definitely be upset. And he realized that he had this moment of, with God of, like, he is putting the, God is putting the police officer in my life for some reason. Yeah. And so they end up 
just being like, okay, let's put aside our differences. Like we both are fine now. The past is in the past. Hmm. And they end up getting to know each other. They like each other a lot. They start hanging out and they end up writing a book together. Wow. And apparently they're like best friends now, like super, super close. Wow. And like, that's just like. What a story of forgiveness. Yeah. And then just to think about like, God has so much more forgiveness for us than that. Mm -hmm. It's just mind blowing. Yeah. Because I know like if you took away three years of my life and like ruined everything, not everything, mostly everything for me. Yeah. But you take away like a quarter of a decade or whatever, like. You're not going to be very happy. Yeah. And then just to hear like how those guys connected is Mm -hmm. incredible. That is cool. So you look to those kinds of videos or those kinds of stories and take anecdotes to apply to your life more so than just idealizing like a person. Yeah. You look to the attribute. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Daniel, would you say you have any... Any inspirational figures that you look to? Yeah, I think it. Yeah, I, I do. But I want to comment, comment on what he was just talking about, too. I think like last week we were talking about Christian forgiveness. Uh, mm-hmm. I think that was the best uh, example of Christian forgiveness I've heard. Yeah. If you think about it, because I didn't wasn't didn't know what Christian forgiveness was last week. Uh, right. Compared to just forgiveness, mm-hmm. big picture. I think that was the best. Mm-hmm. Like open exactly because imagine if they hadn't gotten saved if they were still harboring you know resentment towards each other then something happens where the dude still gets left let off early Mm -hmm. so three years out he's with his kid they're at the park they meet each other imagine what happens if they're not believers like they they would probably still like organize some kind of way to like beat this guy up Mm -hmm. take him out to do do something you know but you see the the forgiveness demonstrated where no it's not right to hold that against Mm -hmm. him as you as you mentioned saying the past is in the past we can move forward and now they get connected and they're able to do such great things because of that forgiveness yeah that comes through christ yeah so probably my um, big, biggest like kind of influences uh <clears throat> it's like i like have you heard of granger smith though maybe the name sounds remotely familiar. He was on I Am Second. His son ended up drowning in the pool in a pool. Oh wow. Yeah. Well, basically, he was a big country star. Uh, okay. Had all these albums and stuff. Uh, and just last year he said, I'm quitting country music. I'm quitting wow. this and I'm becoming a pastor. Uh, wow. So now he's going through seminary and stuff, but he's been pastoring some churches around nice. Texas and stuff. Uh, yeah. But I, like, I love country music and that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. But that just makes me think, oh, well, wow. I, 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 I want, I've listened to his podcast and he, go, he goes deep into what he, if people are asking him about relationship advice and stuff, but he just goes deep into it, but putting it in a God manner. Uh, yeah. And I, I really, I look up to him and, I look up to Cody Johnson. He mm-hmm. he's probably not the best like Christian in the world, but he's still at every concert. He's like, God is there for me. Mm. And he's I recognizes God every time he does a concert. Okay, yeah. And I'm like, and his family life. He's on the road all the time, but he makes sure he's with his family mm-hmm. a lot. Just I look up towards that. Just. Mm-hmm. I believe he's a godly man. Yeah. something I would want to do also. It's just stuff like that. It's just I've heard some podcast like Unashamed with the Duck Dynasty people. I really like theirs. I look up to like Phil and Jason yeah. and them and their and their relationships with God and stuff. But just the, those are the kind of people I kind of look up to. What do you think is the difference to make sure you don't fall into – idolizing people versus just like, I guess having them have an influence in your life or like just learning from them or, or admiring them. Like what's the difference between idealizing somebody and admiring somebody? I would say a, a big part of that 
if like if you're idolizing somebody who's not if you're being influenced by somebody who's christian i feel like a big part of that would be they are pouring into your life through or yeah pouring into your life through god Hmm. and i feel like that's just a big thing to think about because it's super easy to idolize somebody because you'd be like oh i want to be like this person but you don't know what they are going through and so they could be doing something completely away from what the gospel Mm -hmm. is saying but having a big part of or having that thought in your mind of they are speaking or god is speaking to me through them and i feel like that's a big thing to like keep in your mind when you go into these situations of like oh like that's my dream person Hmm. i think that's a good note especially on the fact of you don't know what all is going on in their lives if you we have seen it before of people idealizing somebody thinking that they're the perfect person, the perfect description of whatever quality, the perfect description. And a few years back, we saw a lot of pastors fall into Mm -hmm. this where lead pastors of churches have, would, would, um, they were found out that they were having all sorts of misconduct Mm -hmm. amongst their staff or amongst their congregants. And so now the congregation the people who idealized this pastor, now they their faith is broken because they were actually idealizing the man, not the one he served. Mm-hmm. So what's most important to me is to keep things in perspective, in proper perspective. You have to keep God first and him be the influence in your life, he is the one we look to. And so we look to qualities of what Christ demonstrated, what Jesus demonstrated. Then we look to the people in our lives or people around us, the people in society that demonstrate some qualities that are good and align with what God would have for us. So yeah, there's a lot of people that idolize say Taylor Swift, Mm -hmm. you know, but there's not, yeah, of course, Daniel's the biggest side Taylor Taylor Swift. The the biggest Swiftie. The biggest Swiftie. Every time I get in his truck, it's Taylor Swift. He's dressed in full pink right now. He has no way to not prove it. (laughs) There's no way to not prove it. (laughs) But the, there's a lot of people who idolize Taylor Swift. But there's a whole bunch of things about Taylor Swift that like don't necessarily that don't highlight mm-hmm. God. Yeah. And so if you put your admiration, idolization into Taylor, you're going to be let down because your priority is on who she is. Mm-hmm. And what she's doing and how what lifestyle she promotes rather than putting your faith and idolization into who God is, the one who is worthy of our praise, the one who is worthy of our attention and our focus. If your focus is on someone else, you're going to start em- exemplifying the lifestyle they live. Mm-hmm. So it's important to have influences in your life that point to God. Yeah. Because if you're idolizing, again, if you're idolizing somebody that is not pointing to God, you will eventually take on their characteristics. And then those characteristics, if they're not pointed to God, then you will not be pointing to God. Hmm. And so your idolization of that person will lead you away from the purpose that God has for you. So it's important to have that person also have the same priorities as you. That's one of the things like, so you can have influences in your life that you can learn from aspects of things, but you don't follow them. You don't idealize them. Mm -hmm. I earlier said, I look to Gary Vaynerchuk and Alex Ramosi. 
neither of which are believers. So what I have to make sure to do is when I learn from them, I'm not learning things about faith. I'm not learning things about what I believe. I'm learning business. I'm learning leadership. I'm learning whatever. Those are the things I'm learning from them because they are just gifted in that way. I'm not going to put my faith in them. I'm not going to put my, my value in looking like them because if I do that, eventually my perspective, my priority will shift and will not be focused on God. And so I have to make sure that that is in order for me. The priority order is set for me that I am focusing on God first. And the only thing I'm getting from them is learning a couple lessons of business, not of faith. Yeah. I feel like you see that a lot with the sports teams Mm. where people are idolizing slash worshiping what they desire in their sports team. Mm. And I feel like that gets in the way of a lot of people because there will be multiple times where you see people missing out on church to go to a sports event or to watch a sports event. Yeah. And it's just kind of heartbreaking because you see these people be super strong in their faith on Sundays and super attentive whenever it comes to people's needs Mm. and needs in the church. But then whenever their sports team comes on, it's like, oh, I can't do that. Oh, I'm not going to be there. Yeah. And it becomes a question of like, who are you worshiping? Mm -hmm. That is an excellent question. Who are you worshiping? If your priority order is messed up, if your priority order is I'm going to stay at home to watch the sports match instead of going to church, where are your priorities? Yeah. It's not to say that church attendance is like the end all be all, but you have to check your heart Mm -hmm. if it's repetitively like oh i can't go to church because you know the game's on that if that's constantly your excuse then your priority is wrong Mm -hmm. like it's not about going to church it's about having your priority correct are you even prioritizing your relationship with god (laughs) your church attendance is an indicator of where your priorities are It's not about going to the church. Mm -hmm. It's about exemplifying what you believe. Yeah. Do you have another question or anything or or anything else to add to that? I have a light question. I'm not expecting to get a super serious answer from it, but it's more of like a curiosity. How do you know if you're called the prison ministry? Because I feel like that's not something that's super common. Uh Uh-huh. And you hear all these people, oh, yeah, it was called the prison ministry. It makes you think, how? So I would say it's much like any other call to ministry. You get a specific inclination of where you want to serve. Yeah. So even in in my testimony, I was specifically called to student ministry. Mm -hmm. And the reason that is, is because I just have a heart for my generation and the generation around me. So my co-millennials, Gen Z, I have a heart to reach that group. So that is why I was, I felt led to be a minister for student ministry rather than go be a senior adult minister. (laughs) But there are people who do. There are people who are gifted in reaching specific people groups. Mm -hmm. So prison ministry is an example of that. There are certain people that maybe it's their upbringing. Maybe it's somebody they – if it's not them – so I'll say for some people – they are called to prison ministry because they have gone to prison. Mm -hmm. 
they have made it through prison and seen Jesus impact their life, impact people around them. And so they want to keep going with that. They want to keep that ministry going. Some people maybe grew up around it. Maybe their dad went to, to prison. Their mom went to prison. Maybe they were a police officer or a correctional officer, and they were around those people and saw, once again, Jesus's transformative power in the lives of inmates. Your life circumstances will guide you to the ministry that God has for you. And so you find that those like those inclinations are what lead you to your ministry calling. Mm. The people who are called to prison ministry have had exposure to that and therefore can relate and connect to the inmates in in a different way than per se if I would go I've gone a couple times to to do some kind of prison ministry work, whether it was with our student ministry or whatever, we would go and like demonstrate something or like whatever, I don't know, all sorts of things. We went in and it felt out of my element. Mm -hmm. I was not like super confident in my ability to connect with the people because I don't have that context. Some other people might. Yeah. And those people are the ones who are then equipped to go and share the gospel to the inmates because they can connect on a personal note and then be able to connect on a spiritual level. So that's how I would say like you, you are you know you are called to prison ministry is you will feel that connection to that people group. Mm -hmm. I think that that's oftentimes how people are led to a specific thing. Yeah. I just didn't know if it was different or anything because that's, it's a very different type of ministry. Mm -hmm. And it's not very common, I would say. Yeah. I mean, I think... I think at the very least, it is very much an unsung ministry or like a yeah. a ministry that happens on the side mm -hmm. or it doesn't get the spotlight. Yeah. Quite often, it does not get the spotlight. So we don't hear about it too much. Mm -hmm. I do hear that it exists in many places I've gone, I mean, everywhere I've gone, I have heard of such and such person. Yeah, he goes to serve, uh, he goes to check in on the prison ministry every Tuesday or every whatever. And like, I hear it, mm -hmm. but it's like, it's not emphasized. Yeah. And that's not to say that it's also not effective, not glorifying, not, you know, like, mm -hmm. it's just a matter of, it's just not promoted or yeah. it's, it's, it's just not popular. But it's very much needed, and people are still called to that ministry as well. Yeah. I know that Daniel had a question. Yeah, you did mention something earlier this week. I mean, I ran it by Dylan. He said it was stupid, but... Huh? Well... <laughs> <laughs> Don't make me sound like a bad <laughs> way, <laughs> way to go being supportive. <laughs> I said it was interesting. You said it was stupid. Huh? I said it was interesting. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I was listening. I saw a clip on TikTok of George Janko. He was talking to this big scholar. Huh? Mm -hmm. And he was like. Was it like an older gentleman, skinny? Yeah. Huh? Okay, I know. I've him. seen him too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He goes on college campuses. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he asked him, is it okay for Christians to cuss? Huh? And I'm, I'm like, huh. That's an interesting question uh, because I don't know. It's just, uh, yeah, Christians are cuss, but I don't know if it ever says in the Bible not to cuss also. Uh, mm -hmm. I've also heard it's like demon names if you cuss. And I'm like, it's just, okay. Uh, I want to ask the question, is it okay for Christians to cuss? Uh, so there's multi-levels 
to this. Remember, Brittany, don't say the words. <laughs> <laughs> what words are you talking about? <laughs> uh, to quickly hit on the whole demon name thing, I don't, I haven't heard that. So I don't know about that. I don't know about like the credentials of, about that aspect of it. I, I haven't heard of like cuss words being demon names. I don't know what that is. But what I will say, what I can speak to is one, cuss words, cussing is not an unforgivable sin. Well, technically, every sin is unforgivable. Well, there's one. What? Huh? But Wait. Every sin is, is unforgivable. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> there, there, is, there is one unforgivable sin, and that is to specifically speak against the spirit of, the spirit of the Lord. And so we can get to that passage later if, when we get there. I think it's, it might be in John. Who knows? We might hit on it. Boom, we're perfect. <laughs> Who knows? But there is an unforgivable sin. Everything else is forgivable and forgiven because of what Jesus did on the cross. So if you cuss, does that mean you're going to hell? No. You trust in Jesus. He saves you. You know, like that's, mm -hmm. that's, that's the whole thing. Should we is the question that I come to. So the question is, can a Christian cuss? Technically, yes. Like, do we have the ability? Yeah. Yes. Like some, some Christians do. Like I do hear Christians that do cuss and it's like, maybe you were brought up a certain way. Maybe like you, your environment just that was commonplace or whatever. Did I tell you guys about the time that I like cussed in a message because I didn't know it was a cuss word? What? What? Yeah. So I was delivering a message in Illinois. I was delivering a message. So talking. that's how you got fired. Yeah. No, <laughs> um, no it was like maybe a, just a couple months into my job or something. I don't know. It was very early on. But I just remember um, I'm delivering a message on anger. And... <laughs> The, the line I said was when you're feeling angry, when you're, when you're pissed off at somebody and I, I, I kept going as soon as I said, when you're pissed off at somebody, the entire crowd went <gasps> and I'm like, what? Like when you're mad, was like, it students? Yeah. Oh my goodness. <laughs> and, and I'm like, what are you talking about? And so I, I got really confused in that moment. I kept going with the message afterwards. I went and talked to some of my leaders and I'm like, what'd you think? Like, how did the, how did the message go? They're like, it was good. Except for the part that you cussed. I'm like, what did I say? What do you mean? And they're like, well, you said the, and they're like really, really scared to like say the word. And I'm like, what are you talking about? Like, I don't, I don't cuss. And so for me to like be, be told you cuss in your message, I was like, what are you talking about? Like, that's so uncharacteristic of me. So they said, it's because you said when you're pissed off. I'm like, that's not a cuss word. I don't know what you're talking about. For them, in their culture, in their upbringing, it's a cuss word. And so for me, it wasn't. <laughs> I was brought up and that was not that was not counted as a cuss word. So it's very much like environmental uh, of like, what do you say? What do you not? So let's come back to this. Can a Christian cuss? Technically, yes, yeah. they do. Like some Christians do. Should you? Probably not. Why? Because in scripture, it is said that everything that comes out of your mouth be uplifting to your brethren. So the words that you say have great power and you should not speak ill against your 
brothers and sisters in Christ, but also just anyone. You should not wish, do not curse anyone with the lips of your mouth. And so you should not curse anyone. And that's where cuss comes from is cursing. So you, we should not do that. Now, some people say, well, yeah, but if I just say like such and such word, but I'm not, I'm not saying it out of anger towards somebody. I'm just saying it as like, it's just an expression. I get it. Should you still use that language? Probably not. Me personally, my personal conviction is that it does not add anything necessary Mm -hmm. to the conversation. And so for me, I don't cuss. And I have made the decision of like, I just don't, I don't use that language. I don't find a need for it. That's my personal conviction. I have heard other people's perspectives saying that it's their upbringing that they just they just say these words. Mm-hmm. For them like that it just is what it is. Again, it's not a matter of salvation. You're not losing your salvation if you cuss. It's just like a, it's just a thing of, do you want to (laughs) do that just because you, you like, like, are you asking the question? I know not you, but are you asking the question to like get permission to like, just go and cuss at your friends? Then like. No, like your heart is wrong. You, and like you, if you're just asking these things just to get permission to like do whatever, chances are the answer is going to be no. Yeah. You shouldn't just be looking for permission to go off and do whatever you want or say whatever you want. Instead, you should be looking to God's word at how you can more closely be a disciple of Christ. Mm-hmm. And so... To me, that means watching the words that leave your mouth, including cursing. Okay, I gotta have a follow up question. Okay. What phrases? What makes it a cuss word? Like, that's an excellent question. <laughs> uh, so I would say it's cultural. Very much. I mean, we, gosh. Okay, we're about to to say the words. For me, the big ones are the F word, the B word, and the S word. Oh, great. Demonetize. (laughs) Demonetize. (laughs) I got to check the little box that says explicit. (laughs) Those are like the big ones for me. Half point to the A word. It's my personal viewpoint. A lot of other people will say like the A doesn't count. A lot of other people will say like, the S word is just a word for poop. You know, you guys have heard me. Sometimes I say poop skis. I think, I think that's hilarious. <laughs> is it essentially the same thing as the S word? May Some would argue. <laughs> you know? So it's like the cuss words that are considered cuss words are largely based on culture and society. So that's why you have to like feel it out of who you're speaking to. I didn't know that pissed is a cuss word to the Midwest. Mm -hmm. If I would have known, I would have taken care to not say it because what did that do? As soon as I said it in my message, Everyone's focus left the message and just went to my youth pastor just cussed. Yeah. <laughs> where did they find this guy? Off yeah, the where did this guy <laughs> bring some guy from, up from Texas and this is what he does. Um, so it distracted from me delivering the gospel because I because I cussed. I have heard that people in is it Scotland? Somewhere in like Northern Europe, there's a country there. Tim Ross was talking about it on his podcast that he he visited and the pastor from the pulpit 
was cussing. Wow. Because for them, that's not cussing. For them, that's normal language. They just use that language like in day-to-day speech. So for him, talking about that, it's just helping him explain to people the the gospel message or like the heart, the, you know, whatever, whatever he's message he's giving. If he mentions a cuss word to us, like what we know is a cuss word for them, he, he's just explaining what they do. He's just explaining the thing mm-hmm. in their normal speech. You know how British people, they say bloody whatever. Mm-hmm. That's a cuss word to them. So when we imitate, when we do our our terrible British accents and we say, oh, bloody whatever, you're cussing. Mm. So when Tim, so again, going to Tim, because he he has spoken on this as well. When he's in London, he can't say that. We joke about it. To them, that's serious. Wow. So you can't say those words (laughs) There, because suddenly if you make an expression, including that, you'll have the same effect as when I said, when you're pissed off. Mm -hmm. It's all dependent on, is it detracting from your, detracting or distracting from the gospel message? That should be our, our goal. Is your life pointing people to Jesus? That's our, that's our aim. So look at society, look at the people around you and not to look for an excuse. Don't look for excuses for your behavior. Look at what Christ would have for you, which is why my policy is to just don't cuss at all. Mm -hmm. I should then also be aware of what is a cuss word so that I don't deter, don't distract anyone from the main message of Jesus Christ is the Messiah. You know? Mm-hmm. Does that answer your question? Yeah. We kind of we kind of like jumped around there. I pretty much answered it at all. Huh? Okay, cool. Well, here, let's go ahead and get into John chapter seven. There's a lot of like sub portions, portions within John seven. I, I was looking over it earlier and I'm, it had like a lot of micro sections. So I'll start just in the first, the small section, verses one through nine. I have it. After this, Jesus traveled around Galilee. He wanted to stay out of Judea, where the Jewish leaders were plotting his death. But soon it was time for the Jewish festival of shelters. And Jesus' Jesus's brothers said to him, leave here and go to Judea, where your followers can see your miracles. You can't become famous if you hide like this. If you don't, if you can do such wonderful things, show yourself to the world. For even his brothers didn't believe in him. Jesus replied, now is not the time, now is not the right time for me to go, but you can go anytime. The world can't hate you, but it does hate me because I accuse it of doing evil. You go on. I'm not going to this festival because my time has not yet come. After saying these things, Jesus remained in Galilee. So we are picking up here after the conclusion of chapter six, Jesus has fed the 5,000, crossed the Sea of Galilee. He had an encounter there at the temple in Capernaum, or maybe not the temple, but they, they were in Capernaum. The crowd meets Jesus there as well, and they are seeking him because he is providing for their needs. He is doing all these incredible miracles. And Jesus finally declares to them, guys, you are here for bread, but I am the living bread. I am here to provide living bread to you, which is how you can be with the Father in heaven. So he he proclaims the gospel. He explains to them the severity of their of the situation, of what is requ- required of them to be a follower of Christ. And after this, the crowd leaves and Jesus is left with just his small crew of the 12 disciples. He goes around Galilee and he wants to stay away from Judea. In Galilee, northern Galilee, that's where Nazareth is. So he's hanging out there 
And his brothers are saying, why don't you go down to Judea? That's where, you know, everyone wants to see you do miracles. And the tone that they have is a little bit of like making fun of him in a sense of like, why don't you go down there, Jesus? Everyone wants to see you. Everyone wants to see your miracles that you're performing. (laughs) And because the only reason I say that is because in verse five, it says, for even his brothers didn't believe in him. And I think that's really interesting because it, it, I mean, it'd be like, Dylan, it'd be like Logan coming up to you and being like, I am the Messiah. I have, I can do miracles. Yeah, no. And it's like, no, <laughs> like yeah, we grew up together. Like, you no. Know. Uh, so to Jesus's brothers, it's very hard for them to see their brother mm-hmm. as the Messiah when they just see him as, that's just my brother, Jesus, <laughs> and, you know? So Jesus replies and says, now is not the right time for me. You guys can go. The world doesn't hate you, but they hate me because I just accuse it of being evil. So Jesus is very retrospective here. And he's just like, yeah, the world just hates me because I'm calling it out. I am challenging the world right now and they're, they're going to hate me. You guys can go, you guys can go because they're, they're they're not going to have anything against you, but I'm not going to the festival. My time has not yet come. Let's, let's continue in verse 10. 10 through 24. But when his brothers had gone up to the feast, then Jesus himself also went up, not only in secret, so the Jewish leaders were looking for him at the feast, asking, where is he? There was a lot of grumbling about him among the crowds. Some were saying he is a good man, but others said he has deceived people. However, No one spoke openly about him for the fear of the Jewish leaders. When the feast was was half over, Jesus went up to the temple courts and began to teach. Then Jesus said to the leaders who were astonished, How does this man know so much and he has never taken formal instruction? So Jesus replied, My teaching is not from me, but from the one who sent me. If anyone wants to do God's will, he will know about my teaching, whether it is from God or whether I speak from my own authority. The person who speaks from his own authority desires to receive honor from himself. The one who speaks honor of God, the one who desires the honor of the one who sent him, is the man of integrity. And there is no unrighteous in him. Hasn't Moses given you the law? Yet no one keeps the law. Why do you want to kill me? The crowd answered, You are and you're possessed by a demon who is trying to kill you. Jesus replied, I perform one miracle and you are all amazed. However, because Moses gave you the practice of circumcision, not that it came from Moses, but from the forefathers. You circumcise a male child on the Sabbath. But if a male child is circumcised on the Sabbath, so the law of Moses is not broken, why are you angry with me? Because I made a man completely well on the Sabbath. Do not judge accordingly to external appearance, but judge with proper judgment. So explain what's happening here. Basically, Jesus went to the feast and he started to teach people. Mm -hmm. And the leaders thought that was kind of weird. They thought that was very weird. Yeah. Well, what stands out to them about Jesus' teaching? I don't know if it like... Well, this is what stands out to me. And this is kind of a little passage right now. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's like his teaching, but... It's more like he's asking, what do you want from me? It's like, I do a miracle and you think it's awesome. But if I don't do anything, you think I'm a demon. Uh? And mm-hmm. I'm like, and he's like, what do you want from me? I'm trying to show you the, the truth here. Uh? And you're not wanting to see it. Uh? Yeah. That is something he brings up. He says, I did one miracle on the Sabbath and you were amazed, but you work on the Sabbath too. And you obey Moses' law of circumcision. So it's like he's bringing up all these things of 
I do miracles. You guys love it. I do a miracle on the Sabbath and suddenly you guys have all this problem, but you work on the Sabbath and you have no problem with it because you have to keep the law of Moses, but you're breaking the law of Moses. What is, what's going, he literally is like, what's going on? Look beneath the surface so you can judge correctly. He's like, look at the intention, you know, in verse 15, Jesus says, the people were surprised when they heard him. How does he know so much when he hasn't been trained? And yours says he hasn't had formal mm -hmm. education, formal training yeah. or whatever. So the question that comes up is like, how is Jesus teaching like this? You know, he hasn't been trained. He hasn't gone through, you know, everything. He, he's not a Pharisee. Mm -hmm. He's not one of them, you know. And in their society, everyone looks to the Pharisees. They are the religious leaders. They they know the scriptures. And suddenly Jesus shows up and he's preaching. And it's like, how does this guy know so much? He's not a Pharisee. He's not like, he's not one of the religious leaders. Jesus' response said, it, it, like, separates himself from them. He says, my message is not of my own. It comes from God who sent me. Anyone who wants to do the will of God will know whether my teaching is from God or if it is my own. Those who speak for themselves want glory for themselves, but a person who seeks the honor of the one who sent him speaks truth, not lies. What is Jesus saying? He's saying, I am here. I am not here for my glory. I am here to point you to my father who sent me. If I was here to get glory for myself, you would be able to tell. You can also tell that I am not here for myself. You know that I am here for my father because I am only trying. I am only speaking truth. That's why you have a problem. So, Jesus is trying to explain to them, your focus is on the wrong thing. You get all up in arms because of what I am saying, but all it is doing is highlighting who we are supposed to be focusing on. Mm -hmm. He is trying to highlight God and the connection to him and the coming kingdom of heaven. And the people are just so busy looking at the attacks coming at themselves and being so self-focused that they're losing the point of Jesus's message. Let's go in verse 25, 25 through uh, 36. Some of the people of Jerusalem therefore said, it is not this the man who they seek to kill, and here he is speaking openly, and they say nothing to him? Can it be that, that the authorities really know that this is the Christ? But we know where this man comes from, and when the Christ appears, no one will know where he comes from. So Jesus proclaimed as he taught in the temple, You know me, and you know where I come from, but I have not come of my own accord. He who sent me is true, and him... You do, do not know I know him, for I come for him. He sent me. So they were seeking to arrest him, but no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. Yet many a people believed in him. They said, when the Christ appears, will he do more signs than this man has done? The Pharisees heard the crowd muttering these things about him, and the chief priests and Pharisees sent officers to arrest him. Jesus said, I will be with you a little longer than I'm going to going to him who sent me. You will seek me, and you will not find me, where I am am cannot come. The Jews said to one another, where, where does this man intend to go, that we will not find him? Does he intend to go to dispersion among the Greeks and teach the Greeks? What does he mean, mean by saying, you will seek me, and you will not find me, and where I am you cannot come? So... Jesus here is causing quite a stir. He is causing a question to come up to everyone. Is he the Messiah? The crowd is wondering, is he the Messiah? Because if he, like, this is the guy who's been preaching about all this stuff. I thought this is the guy that the Pharisees were trying to kill because this guy thinks that he's the Messiah. 
But the Pharisees are here and they're not doing anything. Do they think he's the Messiah? So there's all sorts of confusion going on. It's like either this guy's actually the Messiah and now the Pharisees actually believe or he's not the Messiah and the Pharisees aren't doing anything <laughs> or the, like it's all over the place, right? And Jesus says, one of the things they point out is like, how could he be the Messiah? We know where this man comes from. When the Messiah comes, he will simply appear. No one knows where he will come from. Jesus says, yeah, you know me, you're, you know where I'm from, but I'm not here on my own. The one who sent me is true and you don't know him. What a, what a, what a slap in the face too, kind of in the sense of like, you think you're trying to follow God? He sent me and you don't even know him. You think you're following him. You don't even know who he is. That like, man, I know him because I come from him and he sent me to you. All the religious leaders try to get him. Eventually, Jesus says, I will only be here for a little longer. I will return to the one who sent me. You will search for me, but not find me. And you cannot go where I'm going. Again, just causing confusion for everyone listening because they don't understand the depth of what he's talking about. Mm -hmm. They respond, is he thinking of leaving the country <laughs> or is he going to like other, the Jews in the other lands or maybe he's even going to teach the Greeks. Oh no. <laughs> like they're just confused that like, is he, so he's just like leaving. He's talking about like leaving town, leaving the country. And Jesus is like, you don't get it. <laughs> You will like, I'll only be here for a little bit longer and, but, and soon I'm going to leave. You don't understand what I am talking about. Uh, Imagine and, how frustrated he must be <laughs> just to be like, a little bit. Get it. It's yeah. not that hard. Just get it. Yeah. I imagine there is a little bit of frustration in, in Jesus just being like, you don't understand what I'm telling you. And it's not frustration from anger. It's not like he's mad at us. It, it's really him being so brokenhearted. Mm -hmm. He is brokenhearted over seeing us come against him in all these ways, just being so confused. And he's just like, if you would only get it. Yeah. Verse 37 on the last day, the climax of the festival, Jesus stood and shouted to the crowds, anyone who is thirsty may come to me. Anyone who believes in me may come and drink. For the scriptures declare rivers of living water will flow from his heart. And when he said living water, he was speaking of the spirit who would be who would be given to everyone believing in him. But the spirit had not yet been given because Jesus had not yet entered into his glory. Such a small anecdote, verse 39 and yeah, verse 39 is in parenthesis for me. So he just stands up and again says that he is living water. This description is recurring of him being living water, living bread. Mm -hmm. He's trying again to get people to understand it. So let's go ahead and go to the end. I'll, I'll, I'll read us to the end here. Verse 40, when the crowds heard him say this, some of them declared, surely this man is the prophet we've been expecting. Others said, he is the Messiah. And still others said, but he can't be. Will the Messiah come from Galilee? For the scriptures clearly state that the Messiah will be born of the royal line of David in Bethlehem, the village where King David was born. So the crowd was divided amongst them. Some even wanted him arrested, but no one laid a hand on him. When the temple guard, when the temple guards returned without having arrested Jesus, the leading priests and Pharisees demanded, why didn't you bring him in? We have never heard anyone speak like this. The guards responded, have you been led astray too?" the Pharisees mocked? Is there a single one of us rulers or Pharisees who believe in him? This foolish crowd follows him, but they are ignorant of the law. God's curse is on them. And then Nicodemus Remember Nicodemus, the leader who had met with Jesus earlier spoke up. Is it legal to convict a man before he is given a hearing? He asked. 
They replied, Are you from Galilee too? Search the scriptures to see for yourself. No prophet ever comes from Galilee. Then the meeting broke up and everyone went home. So, Jesus proclaims, Come to me, I have living water. Everyone's hearing him say these words, describe these things. They have been hearing his message all throughout the land. And he is getting closer and closer to just describing, to just telling everyone, I am the Messiah. The people know the prophecies. The people know who the Messiah is. However, they also have some preconceived notions of how the Messiah should show up. They kind of expected the Messiah to show up and just like wipe the floor of of Rome and like get them out of here, like destroy the Roman Empire and declare Jerusalem as like the capital of the world and all that. Like they're they're waiting for that heroic (laughs) Messiah. And Jesus is here and it's just like some dude in a robe. And (laughs) it's like, what are you talking about? The the best you've got is is bread and water. We have that. And (laughs) it's like, you're not understanding it. But all these people are now arguing, how can Jesus be the Messiah? Is this guy the Messiah? I think he is, but how can he be the Messiah? He is from Galilee, but the Messiah has to be from, um, has to be from Bethlehem. Little do they know he was born in Bethlehem, but then, you know, they all only know that he was born in Nazareth. So like, it's, it's, it's everything coming to a culmination. I love how, uh, even the guards, when they go to arrest Jesus, they hear his message and they don't lay a hand on him. They come back to the Pharisees and they're like, we've never heard anyone speak like him. <laughs> like, have you heard his message? <laughs> and they're, and the Pharisees are angry. <laughs> you, you have been led astray too. Is there a single one of us that <laughs> believe in Jesus? You th- you're going to believe the common folk. You're going to believe these pe- the, the crowds that are saying he's the Messiah. They don't even know anything. They're insulting the people around them saying they don't even understand the scriptures. Why would you believe them instead of us? You hear the pride in their voice. And Nicodemus steps up. If you remember, Nicodemus was the one that that talked to him in John chapter three. They had the whole discussion in which Jesus told them, I am the one, I am here, I am the Messiah. And so Nicodemus says, well, is it even legal to convict a man before he's had a hearing? And that's really all he says. It's like, can we really even arrest the guy? Like he hasn't even, we haven't gone through due process. He hasn't had a hearing. And the Pharisees look at him. What? Are you from Galilee too? They're so mad. They're so angry at just how many people are believing in Jesus rather than them. Mm-hmm. The pride stands out to me. Their arrogance stands out to me. They are so focused in on, no, I have this right. I know what the Messiah is. I know who the Messiah is. And it's not that man, but they are so caught up in themselves and their understanding and their wisdom that they won't, they they can't see who Jesus is. Mm -hmm. If we look throughout this chapter, notice the little nods to it. The Pharisees first mock Jesus because he doesn't have the same education as them. Then Jesus responds back talking about pride, saying, my message is not of my own. It comes from God. Anyone who wants to do the will of God will know whether my teachings are from him or from myself. Those who speak for themselves want glory only for themselves. But a person who seeks to honor the one who sent him speaks truth not lies. What is Jesus saying? If you are focused on yourself and bringing glory to yourself, then those who speak for themselves want glory for themselves. You will only focus on yourself if you, you, I think I'm flipping this. Those that speak for themselves only want to highlight themselves. Mm -hmm. Jesus is pointing out the pride that the Pharisees have. They speak for their own wisdom, from their own wisdom, from their understanding. 
And Jesus is saying, I am here for my father. I'm not here for my glory. I'm here to point you to the one who deserves the glory. And you can tell the difference because when you hear the tone that Jesus is pointing people to the father and the Pharisees are pointing people to themselves, Jesus says, I have living water. Anyone who believes in me may come and drink for the scriptures declare rivers of living water will flow from his flow from his heart. He is calling people to come to him because he can give them a connection to the father. He's like, I can point you to him. I can get you there. The Pharisees, their message is, what do you mean? You're, you're trusting this guy? You know nothing. We are the ones who understand. We are the ones who have the training. We are the ones who have the, the, the knowledge, the wisdom, the, the, the division there of Jesus pointing to the Father and the Pharisees pointing to themselves is what separates the two groups. Mm -hmm. This really is like an intense sequence of events. Yeah. Of just like Jesus is going from one, one thing to the next of just getting more and more attention on him, more confusion around him. Because so many people are caught up in like what people have, what people have said in the past mm -hmm. versus what Jesus is saying, what the prophecies say to what Jesus is saying, not realizing that Jesus is the fulfillment of all that prophecy. Like there, there's so much that is going on right now in Jesus's life. And yet Jesus starts off the whole thing. Now is not the right time for me to go. He's like, all this is happening. The world hates me but it's not time yet. Yeah. It's not quite there. I'm, I'm excited. Obviously. I mean, we know where Jesus' story leads, but I'm, I'm excited to be walking through this with you guys mm -hmm. and just seeing and, and, and living in this moment kind of with Jesus, mm -hmm. seeing yeah. what he's experiencing, seeing how people respond to him. Seeing the attitude he gives to people. Mm-hmm. I think it's just so funny when he gives attitude to people. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it, it's so interesting, right? Because like he he's giving attitude, but they all it's out of love. love. He's just like, if only you would understand. Yeah. If only you would get it. And it's like, are you the Messiah? He goes, I am. I am the living yeah. water. He goes, but I'm not thirsty. <laughs> That's not what. It, oh, oh no! <laughs> oh, where did I go wrong? <laughs> He's like trying to explain, and they just won't get it. So yeah, he he gives them attitude, but it's it's out of like, it, it's out of a a heart posture of still loving people, loving humanity, and knowing why he's there. Yeah. We'll go into uh, chapter eight next week, but. We appreciate you guys tuning in. Dylan, Daniel, I appreciate you guys being here. It's always a, a, a pleasure going through God's words with you guys. For all of you guys listening, we appreciate you guys. We love you guys. We would also like to ask that if you made it all the way to the end, could you take just a couple minutes and leave us a review or interact with us but with that Q&A question right below? We would love to have your feedback on this. And if you have any questions that you would like us to answer, let us know down there as well. But we will see you guys in the next episode. Bye.